I appreciate the uh, worship this morning. You have uh, no idea how things work through the week in preparing a message and trying to signal um, the worship team what the theme is. The worship team decided to change the theme. And the Holy Spirit directed me to preach a different sermon that matched the worship team's theme. Isn't that amazing? Brian, I think it's amazing how God orchestrates from the very beginning. We do need to continue praying for Aldine's granddaughter, who is 13 and has been struggling physically. Great to see Gloria Betts here. That's a miracle. Take it. Receive it. And other requests that have been uh, familiar to us through the news and uh, the concerns that the church has published about the Christians in Afghanistan and how what the press is saying is not matching the brutality of what's occurring uh, in, in that country toward Christians. I have relatives in Louisiana, be praying for them. Stage four, stage four, a category four hurricane. I don't know if that's been degraded downgraded at all um, and continue to pray for our pastor and his wife as they holiday and uh, hopefully they will have been being refreshed and encouraged uh, through their time away so if you would if we would bow together and pray Heavenly Father we're so grateful that we can bring all of the burdens of our heart and lay them before you knowing that you care and that you are involved even before we utter a word. You know the struggles. You know the cry of the heart. You know how a, a, a grandmother feels and carries the grandchild in her heart. We pray, Lord, that you would grant healing to this young lady as well as bring about a miracle that brings glory to your name. Thank you, Lord, for answers to prayer, for healing physically. And we... We just want to say thank you, Jesus, for your grace and mercies that flow from your throne toward us. And though we do not deserve any of that, you have been gracious and kind and brought healing and wholeness and restoration and renewal. And we just thank you, Jesus. We pray together for our church in Afghanistan, the church of Jesus, your church that you bled and died for, and that you have been calling home in, in many cases lately through the, through the horrible events of what's going on there. We pray for protection. We pray that you would guide them to that place that is safe spiritually as well. We can barely comprehend what it must be like to live knowing that you are being hunted down. And that your family is being separated. That your girls are being taken away from the home. And on and on the horrors of that place uh, disturb us deeply. I know it disturbs your heart too as you see the tragedies that go on. But may there be amazing grace flowing through that country. Even the, 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 the world's second fastest growing church is in Afghanistan. So we pray that this persecution would even further the gospel. Hmm. We pray for your protection from a storm and our, our relatives and family, friends, and all that are right in the middle of the target area for this hurricane. May it not cause the damage that it has in the past, and may life be preserved. But may you be glorified even in the storm, even in the storm. We pray for our mission field, and we think of those that we have been witnessing to. And we pray, Lord Jesus, that there would be much fruit born through the mission field of our church here in this community. I pray for my neighbor, Doug. He's dying of cancer, and he knows he doesn't have you. And I pray, Lord, that you would touch his heart and, and rescue him from the fear of death and as well as the healing 
if that's possible or your plan. But Father, thank you for the opportunity to shine for you. Bless our pastor. Lord, we're so grateful for that husband and wife team that you've brought to this place. And we ask for a refreshing touch upon them and his children. That you might work in renewal and refreshing and strengthening and recasting the vision and and as we move toward that day of dedication of this facility for your glory that he would be more on fire than ever before let it be lord to your glory in this time this may be the very last generation as the opportunity to proclaim the gospel may we be found faithful as a church and as your children we pray in jesus precious name amen well, appreciate the, the opportunity to speak. Lately, I haven't had much of an opportunity. It's been a bit of a recovery time for us. As you can tell from my voice, things aren't normal. I'm not normal. <laughs> but there is some uh, great news from the scriptures. Whether we live or die or whether we find healing or not, God is in his throne working just in powerful ways. And I'd like to, uh, oh, I, what do you think of my shirt? I, I designed the shirt. And, and the reason f f for the, uh, the reason I wear these shirts often is uh, I'm in public when I go for coffee. I want the opportunity to be able to share in, uh, a testimony and how God might, in fact, bring about a uh, conversation that may be um, a moment to be able to share about Jesus. And the, the, the word hope is, is a lost uh, concept in, in the culture that we live in. It seems to be hopeless. <laughs> So to be able to offer hope is, is magnificent. If you can imagine, to be able to share about Jesus is the most glorious testimony that we can give. And here, I just think we should have a, a walking testimony, don't you? Now, mind you, it's in, in all due respect, I mean, we're just looking at a shirt and a stranger wearing a shirt in public. So I don't know really how much that can change until you start the conversation. Because uh, that's where this is all going, is that we learn to connect with our world in a way that we can have a conversation. And, and before we can have a conversation, we have to care about each other. So when my neighbor finally opened the door to allow me to have a conversation, I didn't expect that he'd be smoking marijuana while we're having a conversation. I didn't expect his, uh, well, we won't go into that, but the door has been open and we are talking about faith. We're talking about life and death. And so I believe this uh, walking advertisement, I hope it can bring uh, conversation. That's where I think the church needs to be alive. Because when you leave this place today, you're going to have a conversation, I hope, with others. Before I read scripture, I, I, I want to do the things that don't, aren't, aren't very dignified before I read scripture. Because I, I think after scripture, I need to behave myself a little more. But um, this is a bit of a humorous story. And I'm personalizing it because it's not really true, but... For the sake of the story, I want you to follow along with me as if it were true. Three o'clock in the morning is not my favorite time. The doorbell rings. We're in Florida. And it's pouring outside. And Ruth gives me a nudge in the ribs to wake me up. Says, There's someone at the door. So... I begrudgingly get myself together. I uh, don't know what I had on, but I figure, well, <laughs> 3 o'clock in the morning, 
could be a surprise to everybody. So I go to the door and I open it and there's a man standing drenched looking at me and he's obviously having a hard time standing and my assumption is that he's quite drunk. And I said, yes, sir, what do you, what do you want? And he says, I need a push. And I said, well, I don't think that's happening. I would just find, go back where you are and stay dry and uh, in the morning we can, maybe we can deal with something. And I sent him away. Got back in bed and Ruth said, what was that about? And said, well, that's a drunk guy who needs a push. And she says, and you're not going to do anything? I said, no. It's cold, it's pouring. I'm staying in bed. And she says, no, you're not. You get out there and you give that guy a push. So I get into my jeans and jacket and I go out and he's no longer at the door. So I, I, I yell out the door, are you still there? And he said, yes. And I said, do you still need a push? And he said, yes. I said, where are you? I'm on your swing. My mission today, if I were to use that joke as a profitable uh, conversation for a little bit, I, I think my, my real work and your real work is to give each other a little push, even when you don't feel like it. That push of encouragement, that push from the Word of God, that push from a conversation or a prayer, that push that says, I love you and I need to, I need to give away the love and graces that I feel God has given to me. I think I could push you a little bit today as you could push me. If you would stand together, we're going to read from 1 Peter uh, chapter 1, a conversation about the persecuted church. I think that's apropos for the, the struggles of the world today to speak about uh, the persecuted church. I'll start at verse, before I start at verse 3, let me just give you an introduction. It's directed uh, from Peter, the apostle of Jesus Christ, to God's elect that has been scattered throughout the world. So we could be very much a part of this letter spoken uh, to the church, scattered throughout the world, strangers in the world, beginning at verse 3. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade, kept in heaven for you, who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. These have come so that your faith of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may be proved genuine and may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy for you are receiving the goal of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Amen and amen. Let's pray. Thank you, Jesus, for your word. Your word speaks hope and it produces joy as we celebrate together as the church across the generations. And we still fa face the same things 
as the early church. And we pray that we would be filled with joy as we celebrate our faith today. So much so that it becomes contagious. That it, 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 it infects our community. And brings us closer to fulfilling the plan that you have for us. And for us as the church. We ask your blessing even now as we share together. We pray this, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. We receive this word. This is God's word. This is a powerful statement of where the church should be living during persecution, persecution times. Boy, it sounds familiar if you look back at James. I want you just to kind of just back up just a little bit in the scriptures. James writes, the, James says, a, a servant of God and the Lord of the, of the Lord Jesus Christ to the 12 tribes scattered among the nations. Consider it pure joy. My brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance, and perseverance must finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. Consider it pure joy when you find yourself dealing with difficulties in your life. That's contrary to logic. Doesn't make sense to me. Well, as explained by the scriptures, it does, but, but in the picture of our, our lives, it's, it's often that we let the circumstances dictate how we feel. And it's really the opposite of what it should be. We shouldn't be allowing the circumstances to dictate our emotions or how our hearts are affected or stirred by circumstances. The mature Christian, of which most of you are, has learned that we live above circumstances and we can see God using circumstances to further his purpose and develop in us a greater sense of anticipation of what's yet to come. Some of you, included, have had to face the possibility that our life might come to a premature end. And in those moments, it's, it doesn't escape you that where are we spiritually if that were to happen? And we, we're learning to realize that this life is really quite temporary. I don't have a guarantee that you're going to get home safely. <laughs> Isn't that tragic news? Whoa! Well, I can't predict, and I'm in making no attempt to suggest that is a possibility, although, <laughs> although, you get on the highway, I don't know what could happen out there. I've driven to Calgary three times last week. And I can almost do it blindfolded. I wouldn't suggest that, but. This mercy that we've been living in, we are celebrating it in spite of the difficulty that we face in life and its many challenges. Peter says to the church, the persecuted church, Praise be to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And then he goes through the list. Here's, if you don't understand why you can praise him now, let me give you the reasons. These are the true reasons of what the church is all about. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. Okay, what do I do with my water? That's not my water. Oh, there it is. It's on the floor right beside my chair. Did you?
This does not measure up to the pastor's, pastor's cup, does it? <laughs> Thank you, Brian. My, I don't know if my voice is ever going to recover from the, the surgery. It is part of that journey where you recognize that life is a gift and God has given it to us and he has blessed that gift with the hope of eternal life, the life after this one, which is far more significant than this present one. So praise emanates from the church because they recognize that we have been born again through faith in Jesus Christ. It's not because we have become religious. It's not because we have joined a church. It's not because we've been baptized in some tank. I've, I have baptized baptize people in a river. I've baptized people in a, in a horse trough. I've baptized people in a hotel swimming pool. I've baptized people in a, in, in a big built-in baptismal beautiful uh, tank in this large, these large church facilities. But what's really important is you've been baptized with the Holy Spirit and that you've been filled with Him and that you're living for Him. This is what brings praise to God. And it shines forth from the church. The church should be renewed all the time it gathers together with a recognition. Can you believe it? The mercies of God. See what he has done. Amen. You can say amen anytime you feel like it. Or, when I, or on the other side, when I ask you to. A living hope is what Jesus has accomplished for us. I believe the believer does not die. I believe that is the victory that Jesus has accomplished for the church. You will never die. You will someday step out of the body that you're in, but you yourself will not die. That's the victory that Jesus has accomplished for us. Now, those who are left living to deal with the body, that's another issue, but still... Mm. Paul, I remember P Paul was in the, in the church in Madison Hat, and he was, uh, he was struggling physically, and they, he was put in the hospital. And they said one day that he was sitting in a chair, and he got up and looked like he was reaching out to somebody, and his body dropped. Paul took one step in the body. My friend Paul took the next step out of his body. Absolutely powerful hope in that image to me. Paul is living with the Lord Jesus forevermore. It says here that his, he has entered into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade, kept in heaven for you who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. In his great mercy. Maybe we forget. That is because of mercy that we're saved. Because there's no one, well, let me, let's just clear the slate here. There's no one here good enough to go to heaven. None of you have accomplished that place of where you can enter into eternity by your own works. You're not good enough. You, you never could be good enough. That's why it's called mercy. God's love is through Jesus and his blood was able to forgive and forgive and forgive. And it's, it's, it's absolutely amazing how God loves you. Because some of the things you do are really stupid. I'm not talking about you. I'm talking about the other person beside you. Our understanding falls so far short. Peter's reminding the church, I know you're going through tough stuff. And some of you are going to lose your life to that tough stuff. 
But what really matters is that you shine for Jesus because his mercies, undeserved favor of God poured out from heaven and God takes delight in pouring it upon you. And that can be especially true during difficult times. I've got sermon notes here somewhere. By the way, I don't know if you can see my shirt or not, but it says Romans 15, 13. Well, that's for the educated people who might say, what is that verse? Because they know it's in the scriptures. They probably know it's from Paul's letter to the Roman church. Most of us know that. How many know the verse, chapter 15, verse 13? I'm trying to memorize it, but I'm finding out it's hard. Memorizing when you get Jack's age is really hard. <laughs> right? Yeah, he's... Romans 15, 13 says, May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace. Can't you imagine the world needing that, wanting that, desiring that? Joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. I've got a walking sermon right there. God wants to fill you with joy and peace. So much so that you overflow by the power of the Holy Spirit. That's what the church is supposed to look like when you go to your restaurant. Not someone that complains about the menus not quite the way you thought it was going to be or the, the service was a little slow and, you know, these poor waitresses or waiters, you know, they are so overworked right now because of this pandemic thing, this whatever thing you want to call it. They've, they are working hard to kind of make everything meet and their income as well and you should be tithing you should so you should be tipping no you should be tithing here tipping there something like that every day live for Jesus praise is what comes when you live for Jesus fruit comes salvation becomes revealed to you one one story that where are we on the time What's that four minutes and 12 seconds mean? Nothing. The one, thank you. The one, the one uh, story that captured my attention this last little while was, was on uh, America's Got Talent. Huh. A 30-year-old young lady uh, who is a graduate of Liberty Baptist College has a has cancer in, in three different places in her body. She was able to uh, come to that contest and she sang a song and the title of it and you may have watched it with me. It's okay. It's okay. And that word had kind of like jumped around with them as we realized, well, she's really struggling with cancer and life is hard and she's divorced and things that her husband left her when she came down with cancer and he doesn't want to be married to her anymore. And I won't go to the words of the song. It's not, that's not what that struck me the most. But after the singing of the song and her, her banter with uh, Simon and the others and the other gentleman in the back, Paul. She says, you can't wait until life isn't hard before you decide to be happy. <clears throat> then she goes on and shared, I have a 2% chance of survival. 2% is not zero. 2% is something. And I wish people knew how amazing it is. At 2%, God has given her the chance to live. She says, when things don't go right, 
Don't you want to see what will happen if you don't give up? Don't you see? Don't you want to see what happens? So she says, you can see Jesus through it all. That was another interview on, on another program. You can see Jesus through it all. And that's our testimony. God is at work in his church wanting to bring joy into the church. Paul says to the church in Philippians 4, in verse 4, he says, Always be joyful because you belong to the Lord. I will say it again, be joyful or rejoice in the NIV. First Thessalonian letter, always be joyful, filled with joy, rejoicing. Give thanks no matter what happens. God wants you to thank him because you believe in Jesus Christ. So the psalmist says, after going through some difficult times, he says in chapter 51, verse 12, Restore, restore to me the joy of your salvation. Restore Jesus. I want to pray that with you today. I know some of you have gone through some tough stuff. Or your spouse has been going through some tough stuff. It's usually harder on, the, on you than it is in the person that goes through that stuff. I know that some of you feel exhausted. And I believe this is the place and the time where we encourage each other and God's word is spoken and we hear what God would say to the church. That we as a church need to turn our attention not to the struggle of this world, but to the provisions of grace that God has given to all of us. Let's be frank right now. I believe God is glorified in what's happening in Afghanistan. I think in the worst of the scenarios of all that could possibly be going on there, there is God working behind the scenes in ways that you cannot imagine. Even in the losses of life and the tragedies that we could mount up as saying, isn't this horrific? Similar to the story that happened in Ecuador when these missionary men were killed after they had landed their plane on this dry bed of, by, by this river. Years later, as those people were evangelized for Jesus, the murderer said, when we took these men's lives, heaven opened up and there was a huge crowd of people shouting glory. And we didn't know what they meant. We didn't understand what they were doing. It frightened us to death. And we watched the spirits of these men enter into heaven. Things were happening that we don't know about in the tragedies of life. That God is glorified. And the church needs to shout, Amen, glory to God for his great mercies. They are alive and new every day day. So, in the closing, hmm, out of the five gospel accounts, one is read more than all the others put together. It's not Matthew, it's not Mark, it's not Luke, it's not John, my favorite, but it's you. You, the church, are being read by unbelievers every day as they look for hope and they look for peace. And in you lives the message and the person of Jesus who is the author of all hope. <laughs> May the God of hope Fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow 
with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Let's stand together. Thank you, Jesus, for a message that comes from your scriptures that speaks of an eternal hope that cannot be disturbed by the circumstances of this evil world and where tragedy happens every day. Horrible things beyond our even our imagination. But yet you are Lord of all. You are the author of hope and salvation. And I believe this family that gathers here today is impacting this community in the most positive way with a message of living faith and hope in you. It's because of you, Jesus, that we live and breathe and place our hope and trust. Bless your church, we ask, in Jesus' precious name. Amen. God bless you.